We found that there's two ways to stimulate muscle, and when you're younger, it's driven by hormones, insulin, growth hormone, so you don't really need as much protein. People think, well, you're growing, you need more, but actually it's your hormones that are stimulating the muscle. However, as you age, what happens is the body becomes more resistant to the hormones. There's only two ways to then stimulate muscle protein synthesis, and that is either through exercise or diet. When we talk about diet, we talk about the right amount of protein intake at the right time and the right bolus amount. So it's not just having 100 grams of protein over the day, which is the very minimum all your listeners and subscribers should have, but it's really how you get the right amount at each time to really stimulate that lock and key effect. We'll just call it mTOR. And that is the driver for muscle health. It's an anabolic protein and it becomes this cascade of events that happen that allow for muscle to turn over and to be synthesized. And muscle is so important because it's the organ of longevity. I mean, muscle's an organ, just like the heart. Mm -hmm. The healthier your muscle is, the healthier your life is gonna be. It's the largest unit for glucose disposal, the largest site for fat oxidation. Mm -hmm. So when you think about it, everything centers around muscle. Hello friends, it's Mike Mutzel with High Intensity Health. Thanks for showing up and being here. I'm very excited to be with Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. Today we're gonna to talk about muscle. And I guess we could introduce you as a muscle-centric specialist. So we're gonna talk about amino acids, proteins, different myths when it comes to eating high protein, and why if you're not exercising, you might need to increase your protein intake. So let's kind of dive back a little bit. I know you have a personal interest in fitness yourself. I, I do. it's good to kind of set the stage there that you practice what you preach. I do. Um, I've been involved in dance and gymnastics my whole life. Awesome. So. And what do you do now currently for fitness? Um, currently, just training. Mm -hmm. uh, I love resistance training. I think that muscle is the organ of longevity. And the only way to really keep muscle healthy is to lift weights. Brilliant. Uh, you know, I go through phases. I go through the CrossFit phase and then the metabolic conditioning phase. Right now, I'm on a general rehab mm -hmm. weight training phase. Awesome. So like four to five days a week upper body push, lower body push, kind of like a mixed, uh -huh. mixed. Yeah. But I, I try to do, so this, my current program is two days, lower body, two days, upper body, and then three days intervals and hot yoga and two days long steady state. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, I think that's a nice launching place because one way to stimulate muscle protein synthesis is through resistance training. Yes. And uh, so maybe let's define and um, maybe let's give our listeners a little overview of some of your sure. experience in, in, in this world, 15 okay. plus years of yes. muscle <laughs> amino acids and research, yeah. So I trained with Dr. Donald Lehman. I worked on some of the first human studies a long time ago, many years ago, and Dr. Donald Lehman is one of the world leading specialists in muscle protein metabolism. So really my training came from him and continues through him. And what that means is that we really focus on muscle health muscle protein synthesis and how to optimize body composition. Really, it's how can we be a benefit to humanity. Mm -hmm. And we found that there's two ways to stimulate muscle. And when you're younger, it's driven by hormones, insulin, growth hormone. So you don't really need as much protein. People think, well, you're growing, you need more, but actually it's your hormones that are stimulating the muscle. However, as you age, what happens is the body becomes more resistant to the hormones and you, there's only two ways to then stimulate muscle protein synthesis, and that is either through exercise or diet. And diet, it, when we talk about diet, we talk about the right amount of protein intake at the right time and the right bolus amount. So it's not just having 100 grams of protein over the day, which is the very minimum all your listeners and subscribers should have, but it's really how you get the right amount at each time to really stimulate that lock and key effect. We'll define the locking yeah. key, but I think there's an important point that you mentioned that I think is worth kind of exploring. And as we age, you said the, you know, so when we're younger, the hormones are kind of doing the work, stimulating muscle protein synthesis, the muscles are growing and so on. But as we age, you said kind of a, the hormones affect kind of the receptor and so yes. on. Yes. Now, is that because less hormones are being produced or that the hormones are being produced are not as effective at driving the mTOR? So there is something called anabolic resistance that happens to the muscle. And what that means is that the body becomes more resistant for, for the tissue activation, for mTOR signaling. The hormones naturally are lower and the amount of protein needed to stimulate mTOR is higher. And mTOR is stimulated by leucine. It's actually mTOR C1, 
now, but we'll just call it mTOR. Mm -hmm. And that is the driver for muscle health. It's an anabolic protein and it becomes this cascade of events that happen that allow for muscle to turn over and to be synthesized. And muscle is so important because it's the organ of longevity. I mean, muscle is an organ, just like the heart. Mm -hmm. The healthier your muscle is, the healthier your life is going to be. It's the largest unit for glucose disposal, the largest site for fat oxidation. So when you think about it, everything centers around muscle. So how do you keep it healthy? Right. And as you age, there's a, a paper that really everyone should read, and it's a pro. It's called Protage. It's Protage. It's a position paper. And what they found is that as people age, they actually require more protein at once. So what does that mean? That means they need around 50 grams at one time. That's a lot of protein. That's Can you imagine? So 65 and up are needing 50 gra 40 to 50 grams to stimulate the same kind of muscle turnover. Really interesting, but the natural tendency as people age is to eat less protein because they may right. not be as active or they're not lifting or they're not, um, you know, who knows what. But that's really fascinating. So this receptor becomes desensitized as we age. Anabolic resistance. Anabolic resistance happens. <sighs> Crazy. So this is kind of on that trajectory of sarcopenia exactly. and cachexia. Exactly. It's like pre-diabetes in the sense. Exactly. And what is so interesting about sarcopenia and the anabolic resistance is I believe it's starting earlier. Really the research shows it starts in your 40s and 50s, but we're becoming so inactive that it's, I think it's starting in the 30s. Mm -hmm. So loss of muscle function, muscle strength, fat infiltrates the tissue really you have to be very wise and there's so much confusion around protein because protein is the most emotionally talked about macronutrient right yeah. nobody argues about how much fat well they argue about how much fat but they don't say well fat is an emotional thing i'm, I'm not yeah. going to eat it and nobody really turns down twinkies well our crew does that you know people they like their carbs or they don't like their carbs when it comes to protein you know it's animal based so it's a very emotional issue for people. And I think because of the emotional tie, there's so much confusion about what is the right amount and what are the facts surrounding protein. Not only what's the right amount, but what essential amino acids are in the protein. Yeah. So we were kind of talking before we started recording that mm -hmm. a lot of people look, when they are maybe starting to eat better, they'll just look at their net protein and say, oh, this vegan protein shake or the quinoa, like you were talking about, it has mm -hmm. 20 grams or 19 grams or whatever, but they're not compartmentalizing the protein and qualifying the qualitative aspects of the protein. That's so let's key. talk about. That's key. Yeah. The quality of the protein really determines the quality of your health. Protein and amino acids in particular are the limiting factor for what makes a good diet. Really, you, it's the quality of the protein <clears throat> Granted to say you need high quality fats, you need lower glycemic carbohydrates, sugars, but really it's the quality and the quantity of the protein that defines the health of the diet. Yeah. And what happens is if, and the data is very clear, if you look at uh, animal-based proteins and plant-based proteins, the ability to stimulate muscle is diminished. For example, soy and wheat protein take 40 grams plus to stimulate, to just get that initial reaction of mTOR signaling, mm -hmm. um, and very weak. And whereas say a whey protein would be 25 grams, because really it's based on that leucine, the two and a half grams of leucine, which is necessary for muscle protein synthesis. That is really key. So if you look at a whey-based, if you look at a whey-based protein, it is the highest content of um, leucine. If you look at a vegan protein, you immediately have to cut that number in half. Because the leucine content is just not there. It's very low mm -hmm. and it's not digestible. So typically it's bound by fiber or something else. It is just not usable for the muscle. Um, mm. So that's really important. Vegan proteins, unless they are fortified with amino acids, you can count it as calories. It might be good for gut health, but it is not good for the organ of longevity. Wow, really, really interesting stuff. So what about um, methionine? We're talking about some of the methionine restriction. You, you were yeah. saying that maybe some keto people may benefit because of that. And how right. does that relate to this mTOR and leucine and all that? So I think it's really amazing. When someone finds the diet that works for them, the phenotypic expression of being able to be optimized is incredible. I have patients that do ketogenic style dieting and they are amazing. They are lean, they've never felt better, their blood markers are incredible. Yeah. Then I have some people do a ketogenic diet and I know that they're executing well, so it's not the execution, and they 
gain weight or they just don't feel good. And then you have some vegan and vegetarians do incredibly well. The majority of my patients that I really have to transition them from being vegan because the majority of them, their diet is so skewed in carbohydrates. But what I think is so interesting is that there is a lot of research that's starting to emerge on this concept of methionine restriction, which is an amino acid. And I think that with the ketogenic group, that's what's happening. It's not so much that it's the ketones or that um, ketogenic pathway, but rather the methionine restriction. Mm. And that's my opinion. Sure. The data is not uh, conclusive there yet, but it's really fascinating. So it's a matter of finding which avenue to really optimize your phenotypic expression. Mm -hmm. And so what benefits potentially, whether it's increased lean muscle mass or fat burning, would this methionine restriction kind of garner on the body? What it does is, from my understanding, is that it really revs up the metabolism because you have to account for the fact that you're missing, that you're very low in, in, in an essential amino acid. I see. So endogenous metabolic rate would just kind of lift. Yes, yeah. Interesting. So methionine would be, what are like methionine rich foods? Is it some carb? Protein. Okay, gotcha. So protein yeah. foods. Methionine is lower in fats and it's lower, I mean, there's, I don't think there's any methionine in, in, fat, in fats, but animal or plant-based products are very low in methionine. Mm -hmm. Really the only way to get methionine, the only substantial way to get methionine is through protein. So in, in essence, it's a protein restriction. Really interesting. And I, you know, and I'm a, a, you know, protein is what I feel so passionately about. That's what I'm trained in. But I do see that there is some benefit from doing protein restriction. Mm. Not for a lifetime. Right. Like periodic pulsing, yes. potentially. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that brings up an interesting point because you and I were talking before and you were telling me about your protein intake around training. Mm -hmm. About on the days that you train, you actually eat more protein. And the days that you don't, you eat two meals of protein and the rest are kind of fat, right. like, yeah, veggies. So what I would say to you about that is that when we go back to the science and we think that there's two ways to stimulate muscle as we age, and that is training and diet, you're already training hard. So your muscle is being stimulated. You, what that means is that your muscle is primed to utilize the foods that you eat, the branched chain amino acids. So you actually need a little bit less protein on the days that you train. And the days that you're not stimulating your muscle, you would need between 40 and 50 grams per meal to increase your muscle protein synthesis. To add that stimulus. Yeah. Because I'm not stimulating it. Real. Exactly. Huge tip, guys. Huge, huge tip. And so it's so funny. I mean, I, I thought intuitively I was doing the right thing and, right. and it kind of made sense and things like that. But, but you know what? Sometimes I don't recover optimally like I can feel it like the delayed onset muscle soreness oh, yes. or the heavy legs or whatever and I'm like oh man what you know so that's really I'm so glad we're having this conversation because here consider myself like you know knowing a fair amount of information about this but that's I forgot about those two different stimuluses so love that practical tip yeah um, so we, we're doing higher like 40 to 50 grams you know For you. Just to stimulate what's your lean muscle mass you lean so I'm about 190 191 right now so I don't know I, all right. 150? I have no idea. So the recommendation would be really, I think that the optimal range of protein is 1.6 grams per kilogram. Okay. Which, I don't know, maybe Sam can capture that. Do it. Do it. <laughs> yeah. But that is really what you're looking at. And it's safe to say that everybody, all your listeners, should be doing 30 grams of protein minimum three times a day of high quality protein that they're eating at once. And that's just for the minimal stimulation. That is not for optimal health. Mm -hmm. And the reason that that happens is you have to reach that, reach that leucine threshold, which is two and a half grams. And there's some data su to suggest that actually higher ends of protein really kind of max out the system. Mm -hmm. and like higher quality type proteins? Yeah, is it? Or and quantity. Quantity, okay. Quality and quantity definitely go hand in hand. So we see that if you have, say, 1.8 grams of leucine, which is, so the typical American d distribution, two eggs in the morning, so let's say even a healthy, let's say your, your group, two eggs in the morning, that's what, 12 grams of protein mm -hmm. and 10 grams of fat and maybe they'll add extra fat. So that meal, they've not stimulated muscle protein synthesis at all. And then what would a typical lunch be? You know, a lot of people are fasting, 
like through breakfast, through lunch, but tip maybe some turkey, chicken, bacon, uh, salad. Okay. You know, it'd be kind of a typical thing. So maybe 20 grams of protein. Mm -hmm. So those are two feeding opportunities where we've hit below threshold and haven't actually stimulated muscle protein synthesis. And then typically dinner, people have five ounces, so five to seven ounces of chicken, chicken. fish, steak, whatever. Right. So yeah. we know that if there's in every one ounce, there's roughly, if you're not talking about fish, there's seven grams of protein. So if you have five ounces, you're getting 35 grams of protein. You're actually then reaching the stimulus at that one meal. So you do that for a lifetime and you've only utilized that feeding opportunity once. And you only stimulate your muscle mass through diet, really for that maximal muscle protein synthesis one time. Over a lifetime of continuing to eat that way, you really can decline if your activity changes, then you no longer, your muscle health is totally compromised. Because you're not getting the stimulus from the activity, so yeah. then you rely upon it on the diet, you're not hitting it with the diet. So then people wonder why they can't lose weight, why they have totally. blood sugar issues, why they're yes. aging faster than they should. Yeah. Wow, this is really, really practical stuff. I love this. Um, so I would say that we, so fasting is great. Yeah. I love time-restricted feeding and intermittent fasting. It, you have to, I, I recommend doing it with branch chains, which then I would say that, you know, say with a, a hardcore keto group would say that that's no longer fasting. Is mm. that true? Yeah, they would say that. Okay. So let's say that they didn't use branch chain amino acids and you didn't use fat, you were just purely fasting. Then that first meal should have around 50 grams of carbohydrate, or no, please don't do that. <laughs> 50 grams of protein. Yeah. You know, if they're a woman, they could get away with 35. If you're a man, you really, you want to think about 50. Mm -hmm. And even if you're fasting and you do those two meals a day, um, you know, I'd like to see a little more than two meals a day, but getting that right amount of protein is essential. Really distribution over time in that first meal is really the most important. Mm, so to kind of kickstart it. Yes, they looked at brain studies. So I did my fellowship at Washington University in St. Louis. I did a two year combined research fellowship out of Sam Klein's lab. And we looked at fMRI studies. We looked at brain scans. And what we found is that when the diet is high in protein, four hours, five hours later, if you then re-image their brain, the cognitive control issues, the cognitive um, wiring, when you show them a carbohydrate, it doesn't light up. Mm. It's not as active. That's that satiety inducing yeah. effect. So if you have yeah. people that may have emotional eating problems or can't seem to regulate their appetite later on in the evening, a high front-loaded protein is so much better. Brilliant. Now, do you recommend breakfast eating in general? Like you mentioned, you're no. a big... Oh, okay. I don't. Yeah. I think that okay. time-restricted feeding and intermittent fasting is fantastic. Okay. But I do recommend that that first meal needs to be a meal with a high-protein bolus mm -hmm. because now you need to really feed, feed your muscle. I also recommend training in the morning. So, you know, we talked about what are the two ways to stimulate muscle. We talk about exercise and training. So if you're not, or exercise and diet, and if you're not going to eat, you should train. Right. So an idea, everyone's individual, right? But if we want to burn fat, build muscle, stay lean and healthy, yeah. optimize this beautiful organ called muscle tissue and so on. So we do fasted training in the morning and then we're doing intermittent fasting or time restricted feeding mm -hmm. and yet high protein. So when would the first meal be? And then I guess that gets into the next meal about um, you know timing and so forth. Yeah. Um, what would that look like? So this is a really interesting and kind of complex topic. I would not recommend time restricted feeding for everybody if you are in fantastic metabolic health. So it's tricky, right? So when I see my patients, I do a lot of weight management. The first thing that I do, I determine if I'm gonna put them on a ketogenic style diet or really where their carbohydrate tolerance is and where I need to put them for protein. I initially start everyone off with three meals a day, high protein. And when I say high protein, I'm not talking high protein. People think, you know, 30 grams, three times a day is high. It's not, that's the bare minimum. So I would start them on that program. If they want to lose body fat, so then, then it becomes what kind of training. If you are doing some kind of training that is heavy lifting, those kinds of things, right, you're a CrossFit athlete, I wouldn't do that fasted. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I mean, they'll tank, right, they'll bonk. But I don't necessarily think that you need to stimulate your insulin prior to training. So I do like the concept of fasted training depending on how intense they're training. So that's important. And then post-workout, the body is primed to take in amino acids. So post-workout, if they want to have protein, they only need about 25 grams. Because it's so much more efficient. Yeah. Yeah. 
Exactly. Sure. And is there any truth, and I've read the studies that go kind of both ways about post-workout insulin spike is needed to kind of optimize glucose uptake and amino acid uptake? Yeah, yeah. a little bit. So, and that, it is true, it is helpful because mTOR signaling is stimulated either by insulin or by, you know, branched chain amino acids. The interesting part about protein, and everyone argues that protein causes insulin to spike, it's actually only a phase one reaction. So it's not this long insulin kind of spike. It is a very quick spike to get the you know branch chains into the cell, and that's it. Mm. So it's not doesn't elevate blood glucose. It's not like having a carbohydrate at all. Interesting. So let's let's define that because that does come up a lot in the keto world right. because you need low insulin to, to make right. the hepatic production of ketones. Right? People talk about that. So the argument is well, then protein affects insulin that affects ketosis and fat burning and all that. But so if we were to spike our blood glucose like with sugar, so it's going to be a long, prolonged release of it's insulin whereas proteins. Yes, and I it's see. a f so with it's different, right? Mm -hmm. So if you you have a continuous glucose monitor on yeah. which i thought was so cool <laughs> if you have protein your blood sugar is not going to spike you may have a small spike in insulin for a very short period of time just a phase one release to get the muscle to get the the protein into the cell that's mm -hmm. it um, the the tricky part with a ketogenic diet is brand is that protein does get converted to glucose it you know it goes through a gluconeogenesis mm -hmm. that being said branch chains are uh, more ketogenic. Right. And those are the, the amino acids that we're focusing on. Yes. Yeah. So that becomes really tricky. So mm -hmm. if you, the thing about ketogenic mm -hmm. dieting is you're not, there is some protective factors for muscle, but you're not stimulating your muscle in the same way. So it's really about balancing your lifestyle with your training yeah. and then determining where you're going to put the protein in and, and how that's going to happen. Yeah, um, that's a good point. A lot of people that I've been speaking with lately, and my personal opinion is I can still maintain high, fairly decent levels of ketone. Well, first of all, we haven't really defined what nutritional ketosis is. Just because you have a blood millimolar of beta-hydroxybutyrate, what does that really mean mm -hmm. at the cellular level and things? So that being said, a lot of people are, that are athletic and doing keto for that application or for cognitive clarity are not necessarily totally scared about the protein. So I think, you know, this, you know, like what you're saying, 30 to 40 grams, particularly on days you're not adding that stimulus, from yeah. training is key. Um, but let's talk a little bit about insulin and mTOR uh, because yeah, then it kind of weaves into the cancer world. And yes, that, yeah. it's a great topic. So it's really important before we talk about that to look at the studies. The studies use mouse models that are ad libitum fed. So actually the mouse models that they're using are obese models. So that really doesn't correlate to human longevity being fit. It, they're totally different. So these are obese rats that are already at risk for, um, you know, their excess calories. They're all at risk for cancer, mm -hmm. right? So right. it's not the same. The concept that mTOR signaling causes cancer, there's mTOR in every cell. And when it comes to muscle, the leucine that stimulates mTOR is really targeted for muscle protein synthesis. There's no evidence to suggest that that is relates to cancer. Mm -hmm. The mTOR signaling, when we think about cancer, you're thinking about excess calories and excess carbohydrates and multiple meals. So when you have muscle protein synthesis mTOR signaling, it's a burst and then it's done. It's not this chronic continuous mTOR signaling that happens. Right. So there's really no validity when it comes to protein causing cancer. So to kind of summarize it, we have mTOR, muscle protein synthesis, that's a little bit more specific to like the muscle tissue. Mm -hmm. And if we're talking about like cancer, uh, maybe within the breast tissue or the brain right. or whatever, that would be more specific to that different cell type. And insulin. leucine, right. in insulin mediated, not leucine mediated. Right. Okay. I, I would say that that's right. Interesting. Quasi. That's good yeah. enough for what we're talking about, right? So as long as we're not, you know, overeating, like you mentioned in the animal model study, we're having too many carbohydrates and That's driving, the driving the insulin-mediated yeah. mTOR exactly. growth. Exactly. Exactly. It. So mm -hmm. it's really this excess of carbohydrates and this just chronic stimulation. It's the chronic feeding, the grazing of carbohydrates throughout the day, Yeah. right? I mean, I don't recommend snacking. I recommend people allow, you know, if you feed every four hours the muscle resets and then you get another opportunity to stimulate it um, and then but with chronic feeding small snacking throughout the day then you're stimulating mTOR right if you're spiking your insulin you're having a high carbohydrate load that's like the worst thing you can do 
Brilliant. So it's really good to like, like eat and fast for a little yes. bit, of, like three to four hours, like you're saying. Yeah. Uh huh. Probably even pushing four, four to five, mm. um, which you know you just have to really be careful and think about how you know what is your metabolic goal. Yeah. So when I see my patients, the first thing I ask them is, what is your metabolic goal? Do you want to build muscle? Do you want to lose weight? Where, where are you at? Yeah. You know. And if they want to build muscle, then that's a different plan than if they really want to lose weight while maintaining their lean tissue. Mm -hmm. Time-restricted feeding works really well for those people. And if they want to build muscle, might cram right. in another meal or so yeah. in there. Absolutely. Yeah. But still maintain, just still not try and snack. So you at least get three hours because that, I think you highlighted a couple of times offline too that this mTOR reset is kind of key. Yes, definitely. Brilliant. And snacking isn't great um, for anybody. You know, from my perspective and from what I believe and what people really need to know is the whole concept of protein is wrong. Yeah. I mean, we, the whole concept of how we think about protein, how much we eat is wrong. I mean, you should be eating around 150 grams a day. Once you're out of ketosis, for you, I would say you need 150 grams of protein as you mature. Mm -hmm. My dad, who is 70, he's eating 150 grams of protein a day. That guy does not slow down. It's awesome. Because yeah. it's protective and we are not moving the way that we used to. We used to be so physically active, so we used to be stimulating our muscle more. So actually, arguably, the more sedentary you are, the more protein you actually need. And you have to get the dose right. It's not a percentage of calories. The lower your calories are, the higher your protein needs to be. Hmm. And can you explain that a little bit? Because people might not understand yeah. that totally. When you think about managing your caloric intake, you cannot reduce your protein to fall you know, 20, you know, make it 20% of your calorie intake. Mm -hmm. The lower your calories are eating, the higher your protein needs to go because A, you go into starvation, right? And B, how are you protecting your muscle? You have to eat protein to protect your muscle. So really, you can lower your carbohydrates, you can adjust your fat. One thing I never do is I never try to change protein. I mean, it's so important and the, the, there's so much agenda-driven information out there about sustainability and, and those kinds of things that really affect people's health. So my fellowship was in nutritional sciences, obesity medicine, and cognition. I saw obese patients, and then I saw the cognitively impaired. I saw geriatric patients, the other end of longevity. And through a lifetime of yo-yo dieting, low protein, their brains and their muscle tissue is gone. You know, and it, it's totally preventable. Mm -hmm. I mean, and we have all these myths that protein causes cancer, protein is bad for the bone, protein is bad for the kidney. Yeah, what's up with that last one, the kidney? Where, where's, is... If you have a compromised kidney, then the load of the protein is too high, but if you're healthy, protein helps GFR. Mm -hmm. And for bone, what do you think, like what is bone made of? Mm. Bone is made of protein. Hydroxyapatite and that sort of thing, yeah. So if you go a lifetime of, you know, suboptimal feeding, the, per the repercussions are crazy yeah. and fixable. Right, that's brilliant, yeah. But we were before the sirens and yeah. all that, you were talking about snacking. I, yes. I want to finish that up because I think it's important. You're saying snacking's not really good because... Well, one, you have to think about what is your purpose for feeding. So snacking, it, it's so much better to, to first train your body to be a little hungry. People think that being hungry is not a good thing, but being a little hungry is good. When you don't snack, you allow your body to actually reset, the metabolic pathways reset, mTOR signaling resets. So then when you feed again, you have an opportunity to maximally stimulate your muscle protein synthesis, which we know muscle is the organ of longevity. When you snack, you train your body to snack. You train your body to have this pulsatile amounts, you'll stimulate mTOR, and you do not want those kind of constant stimulations. Because that can lead to aberrant mTOR signaling, yeah. like cancer and so on. I wouldn't say, yeah. I, I, I don't know if I believe the data that, that it will lead to cancer, but from a clinical perspective, it leads to unstable blood sugar. I mean, they're up and down, they're hungry, they're snacking, there's, they're what we call chaotic feeding. 
kind of loss of metabolic resilience or For metabolic sure. flexibility. Absolutely. That's a really good phrase. Yeah. Yes, they definitely lose their metabolic flexibility. Which is what we want. So even if you're doing high protein and low fat, where if you're not yeah. keto, whether you're keto, right. uh, the ability to be able to not crash and fall apart right. if you miss a meal or whatever right. while you're working, while you're busy exercising. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so there's some other, we've talked a lot about leucine, which I love, and obviously you have a great passion for it, but there's carnitine, carnosine, creatine, there's a lot of wonderful nutrients yes. in meat. And also, the, let's maybe start with glutamine and get into those guys. What should we know about glutamine? So glutamine is interesting. Glutamine is primarily for the gut. How I like to think about the amino acids, rather than break them all down, I like to think about it from a macroscopic view. I feed the muscle first. Branched chain amino acids are disposed and utilized by the muscle. If you get the muscle protein right, and you get the amount of protein to feed the muscle, then you get enough arginine for NO2, then you get enough creatine, then you get enough taurine, then you get enough methionine. So when you think about, in general, how to really get what you need without having to take supplements. So people that are on a ketogenic diet should be taking branched chains, should be taking glutamine. You'll then require other amino acids and other supplements. But when you are really hitting enough to look at the macroscopic view of the big tissue, then everything on a cellular level becomes is able to be met. Mm -hmm. um, that's so brilliant. that's really what I think about. Glutamine and yeah, I mean those. glutamine and just all of them. The um, carnitine and carnosine yes, and creatine. and taurine and arginine that mm. really rather than break them down and have them separately, I don't, I don't think is the most optimal concept. I think that if we use food as medicine and we get the food right on a large tissue level, then everything follows suit. Um, unless of course you have a gut issue, then maybe you'll add extra glutamine, which is fantastic but really it's about utilizing food as medicine. And actually, why don't we talk about um, bone broth? I would love to. Yeah, let's hold that thought because it, it ties into the digestive health just okay. a little bit. So we talked about your father who's seven years old and he's having 150 grams of protein yes. per day. and he does not slow down. Which is awesome, I love that. So what, what do you mean by slow down? He's not losing muscle mass, he's still active, all <sighs> that. I mean, so he, ref so he lives in Ecuador, he's mm -hmm. an expat. He's a former All-American wrestler. He will not, if it, takes he walks 10 miles a day i mean the guy is crazy he yeah. lives off the grid he is just does his tai chi he does his resistance exercise he's very physically active mentally active and he does intermittent fasting with a high protein load brilliant and he looks like he's great jacked. yeah yeah he looks I really good he, I, I, you jacked. posted a picture recently yeah. you guys were hanging out um so some of my functional medicine uh, the audience will say oh well hydrochloric acid production declines so then all that that protein bolus what do you say to that i would say uh, i would say test it i would say be very data driven um i think it's important to get information so you can do a heidelberg test you can do a stomach acid test and it does decline with age so you can easily add it in mm -hmm. but i would also caution to say that that you have to look at what is the metabolic endpoint that you're looking for. And my main metabolic endpoint for the mature individual and for the age, for aging, is to protect against sarcopenia and to protect against immobility. So having the, you know, even more so than the younger, than the, your younger viewers, the older viewers, they need to really understand that protein comes first. Muscle health comes first. Yeah. And by getting that right, whether they need to take digestive enzymes or whatever it is, is essential and key. I've seen it from the other end. Yeah. It's tragic. Right. The loss of muscle. Oh my gosh. And, and you know, it, it, it's tragic and it doesn't have to happen. It's mm -hmm. just really about being educated on that the, you know, once you're hitting 40s, 50s, 60s, that you have to really feed with a purpose. Because that anabolic resistance that we yeah. talked about earlier yes. is kicking in. Um, one other thing that we talked about before bone broth uh, was the liver uh, offline. You're talking about the liver. So even though leucine, I'm going to get the numbers totally wrong, but even though we had a small amount of leucine, the liver's kicking out a lot of these branched chain aminos. So the, um, I get this question a lot, well, what about NASH and people with fatty liver? Because they're, if you look at their blood levels of amino acids, they're high. And it's not, it's a, it's a metabolic marker of insulin resistance. And then people will argue and say, well, but then why would you add more protein to a liver that's struggling because amino acids go through the liver first? And the argument would be, one, the most important thing to do is to reduce the carbohydrates. This group can do well on a ketogenic diet to start. The liver uh, metabolizes all the amino acids and 
branched chain amino acids make up 20%, roughly 20% of the protein, which is not high. Mm -hmm. But when the liver kicks out the amino acids, it makes up 70%. So it's that important. And then it goes to the muscle tissue, is recycled, glutamine, alanine, and metabolized for energy. But it's very interesting to know that that's how the body is designed. So if people are eating a low protein diet and low animal product or whey or not adding branched chains, then, I mean, the body has designed this system mm -hmm. to wow. be to utilize branched chains. Yeah. Um, so anyway, your question was, what about liver health? And, and the argument would be, unless they have cirrhosis, I would not worry about protein. Mm -hmm. So the liver is able to, to yeah. process it. And yeah. you know, you can measure it. You can measure ammonia. You can measure it BUN, those kinds of things, which mm -hmm. I've never seen elevated. Right. But also, I mean, to your point, that a, a large percentage of non-alcoholic steatohepatitis and NASH is from too much carbohydrate. Yeah. So, so what are we going to do? We need to up the protein and healthy fats and drop the carbs to help to restore that metabolic flexibility. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think a ketogenic diet is a good segue into doing things. I think that there is a period of time where they do really well with my patients that want to lose weight, if they're very dedicated, it, it's, it's a really good uh, metabolic reset. And I believe it's a good metabolic reset because of the methionine restriction. Mm, love that. Um, that's cool. Uh, that's my opinion. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm gonna start looking into that. I haven't you know, heard that and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, let's go back to bone broth. You had a really yes. something cool and I totally yes. shifted, but No, because yeah. people say, I, my patients say, I'm getting my protein, I'm having bone broth. And the answer to that is bone broth is high in proline and glycine, but totally devoid in the branched chain amino acids. So I think that bone broth is amazing, but it's not amazing for muscle health. I don't count it as a protein. Maybe good for joint, hair, skin, nails. Right, but it cannot count. I have a lot of more vegetarian-based, you know, when I have a vegetarian-based person, they say, well, but I'm getting my bone broth. And you just, you can't that and make that for muscle health. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing that, you're gonna have to eat meat and or supplement with BCAs to yes. get the leucine. Yes, yeah. and also with branched chain amino acids, it's a bolus amount, so you shouldn't be sipping on them. Mm -hmm. You should have it all at once to get the amino acid load in the bloodstream to get the, the metabolic triggering effect that you want. Ah, brilliant, okay. Yeah, and you mentioned sipping because we're in New York, right, filming this, and yes. there's like bone broth cafes, bone broth to go, it's like Starbucks yeah. at this point, yeah. So you can get, okay. Um, Let's talk about the cooking process and how does that affect some of these cool amino acids that we talked about. So periodically I'll do rags, you know, just for fun to get different types. Delicious. Just like raw broccoli, cooked broccoli, steamed, roasted. I like to always like not only vary the type of vegetable, mm -hmm. but the type of cooking. Um, what cooking process is optimal if so? Um, so in terms of changing protein digestibility, it's really just, it doesn't necessarily make a difference. As long as you're getting, whether you're having raw beef or cooked beef, the, the, the quality of the amino acid doesn't change. There is the denaturing that happens with eggs, but it doesn't necessarily change the amount of amino acid. Okay. So eat as many raw eggs as you like. Brilliant. I do like it. I mean, it tastes different. You know, you get used to it. But, you know, it's funny. So like, I travel a lot. And sometimes in Canada, I see people eat like raw bison and raw elk. Like uh -huh. even at Whole Foods, this guy literally was cutting up a steak, eating it raw. Uh -huh. It was unbelievable. And he was telling me all the benefits of it and so on. So... It's kind of interesting yeah. when you think about it. I mean, the nutrients, there is concepts of, in terms of the other nutrition that I'm not familiar with. Actually, it would just be my opinion. I, I wouldn't be able to tell you the studies that I've read, but the there is a whole group of people that believe that raw is better mm -hmm. and um, less cooking and, and those kinds of things. Yeah, interesting. I don't think too many people are there yet. You no. have to be pretty hardcore. I think yeah. eggs... Even that makes some people squeamish, like raw eggs. Like, I totally seriously? do that. Yeah, yeah. My yeah. husband's like, that is just <laughs> yeah. so gross. I can't so believe you just funny. put that in your cabbage. Right. It's totally fine. It's a, yeah, the, the choline or the egg yolk uh -huh. tastes really rich mm -hmm. and much more rich than cooking it. I agree. Um, brilliant. Well, this has been a lot of fun. We have four final questions, Dr. Lane, that we ask every guest on the show. And the first one yeah. is if there was one exercise, only one that you could do for the rest of your life, what would it be and why? Deadlift, full mm. body movement. Brilliant. Sumo or Romanian? Sumo. Uh -huh. I love sumo deadlifts. Awesome. Yeah. Me too. Cool. Love it. One herb, nutrient, or botanical. You just couldn't live without it. Vitamin D and omega-3s are covered. Maybe you're going to be stranded on a desert island. What's going with you? <sighs> that is a hard one. I only get to pick one. I really think vitamin C is incredible mm -hmm. uh, for antioxidants and cancer prevention and everything. Yeah. 
Um, what any particular form? There's a buffered squirt. vitamin C. Okay. We use it. I mean, I use it here all the time. In the IVs too. Uh huh. Yeah. So our IVs go up to 50 grams. It's crazy. Some good data out of University of Kansas talks about the anti-cancer effects. So vitamin C is amazing. That's the first thing that pops in my head. And really the adaptogen herbs living in New York City, I don't know if I could live without ashwagandha. Yeah, it's busy. It is crazy here. <laughs> it's right here. I know. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. It's got a good vibe, but yeah, definitely. But let's talk, so we talked all about muscle protein synthesis. And yeah. Some people are taking like antioxidants after they exercise. What are your thoughts? I mean, there's a normal natural process, so I wouldn't blunt that Yeah. in terms of putting on antioxidants after you train. Like those free radicals right. cause signaling that's positive. Exactly. Brilliant. Uh, so you're a busy practitioner, busy yes. doctor here in New York. Um, we know that successful people have a morning routine, some sort of rituals, you know, things that they do every day. Yes. What does your morning look like? I wake up, I meditate 20 minutes, transcendental meditation, and then I write about any thoughts that come to my mind, um, how I'm going to crush the day, what I'm already grateful for, and how well that my day went. Before that, I fi before I finished my day. Brilliant. Yeah. Oh, so you like preemptively? Uh -huh. yeah, so yeah. this day was amazing. I met with Mike and yeah. Sam. We did this. I, you know, I saw this patient, and this was a really successful experience. And I and I write it, and I write it at the beginning of the day. That is awesome. Yeah. So okay. I program my day. That is so fantastic. I've never heard anyone say that, but it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. So in the morning, my um, my sister, one of my best friends, I. You know, I'll text her and I'll say, well, how was your day this morning? Yeah. And she'll to get tell her thinking me, that way. And she'll tell me, yeah. And she'll tell me all about her day. That is so cool. Yeah. I love that tip. Mm -hmm. People are going to dig it. I love it. So final question. If you were in yes. an elevator um, or a lift, we were just in the UK. They call okay. elevators lifts, right? And you're with a parliament member, maybe a congressman, senator, and they're about to go have a meeting. And they said, Dr. Lyon, uh, what sort of health or lifestyle tip would you want me to know so I can share with my... Oh. My local politicians and, and yes. uh, yeah. protein distribution over time. Everything we know about protein is wrong. You need at least 30 grams of high quality protein three times a day will protect you for life. Three to 30 to 50 grams, I think would be incredible. It's brilliant. So important. Love it. Fantastic. Yeah. So you have, you're a wealth of information. This was so practical. People are going to dig this show. If, if folks want to see you as a, as a patient for sure, um, or learn more about your work and they know mm -hmm. you're, you know, kind of working on a book. It's kind yes, of hush hush. I'm working on a book with yeah. someone. As, how can space. folks, how can folks contact you? I'm at the Ash Center. They can go online and uh, look up the Ash Center and we're at 61st and 5th Avenue. We have a very large integrative practice as you've seen. Yeah. And that's how they can find me. Or they can email me at glion at ashcenter.com. Awesome. And you're on Instagram too. I am. Yeah. Is that your most active social? Yes, I'm working on it. You know, as, as practitioners, we're kind of busy and yeah. do less of the social media, but I'm going to be working on having someone help me with that. Right. You have some great videos on there. Yeah, you do You do a good job okay. with that. So that's really I'm cool. Working on it. But yes, on Instagram, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. Yeah, okay. I'll put that in the show notes, guys. I really appreciate you tuning in. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Please subscribe. Check out Dr. Lyon's practice in the Ash Center here in New York. Thanks for tuning in.